Okay. Um, shall I just make a start? Yeah. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome to this Ask a Chemist series. Um, so today I'm delighted to introduce Anthony Fletcher. Um, Anthony is the founder of Believe in Science, which is a scientific R&D business. Uh, and before that, he was the CEO of Grey's um, and helped it to become the UK's number one healthy snack brand. Um, within this time, Anthony's been responsible for taking the business to the US, achieving a $32 million run rate in the first year, launching the brand into retail, securing distribution in over 40,000 stores, as well as leading the sale of the business to first to private equity group Carlyle in 2012, and then to leading global, global consumer group Unilever in 2019. Um, and previously, Anthony held various roles at the smoothie business Innocent Drinks. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Anthony, who will... Um, do a, a brief presentation and then we'll open the floor for questions. Take it away, Anthony. Thank you very much, Zoe. And, you know, so excited to be here, you know, in, in this group. And, you know, my story was originally studied chemistry at Oxford and Princeton and, you know, kind of deeply loved it as a subject, um, but really struggled in the lab. Um, and what I thought I wanted to be was an entrepreneur. And I had no idea how, how you go about actually becoming an entrepreneur. But I got very lucky. Um, I went and knocked on the doors of a business called Innocent Drinks when it was really quite teeny tiny and, and they opened the door and I and asked for a job and extraordinarily they ended up giving me one. Um, they let, later admitted because I was probably good at maths and um, you know they, need, they needed a lot of maths doing um, and what that let me do was join this small business and really understand what it is like in a small food and drink business. And the good news was Innocent Drinks did incredibly well. So it grew um, and changed over the years and eventually sold to Coca-Cola. Um, and I thought this is a wonderful journey. I've learned a lot more about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. This is time I'm going to do it. And I was driving my wife absolutely mad at home, making different concoctions in the, in the kitchen of our flat in London. Um, but I never got around to launching any of them because um, something turned up um, in my life, which looked like this. I don't know if people you know, are familiar with this or remember it, but it was a graze box. And this was, you know, sort of maybe 14 years ago. Um, and, you know, this was sort of online had appeared, but, you know, not to the extent it had today. And, you know, I saw this as an extraordinary thing. And, you know, this industry, I love the food industry, seemed to be changing. And rather than having to sell to the retailers, you know, Tesco and Sainsbury's, et cetera, you could go direct to the end consumer and have a relationship with them. Um, so I got my job at Gray's, having seen this box in the same way. I went and knocked on the door <laughs> and again, the founders opened it and they, you know, they gave me a job. The, the difference was um, this time because of my experience at Innocent, you know, I, I had a bit of an idea of what it was like in startup businesses and scale up businesses. And they actually ended up making me um, the CEO. Um, and I was there around 11 years. As Zoe said, we took it to the US. We took it from being an online only business into, into retail and eventually sold it to Unilever. So um, I've been involved in part of these two very successful food and drink businesses, both of which went on to be kind of number one in their categories um, and was deciding what I wanted to do next. And I certainly wanted to go back to the beginning, but you know, what was I really passionate about? What did I think? this industry which I loved really needed and decided just to start a company called Believe in Science and it was based on two beliefs and you know some people might find these beliefs controversial or not. The first belief was that consumers actually find it really hard to change their habits. Both Innocent and Grace had tried to convince people to make healthier choices and it had been really really hard to get people to give up um, these products that they're more used to, these addictive products, which are, you know, part of culture and society and, and you know, and the habits we all have. Um, so I was like, oh, I don't think the answer is simply getting people to change. The second thing, um, you know, I believed is that science is a wonderful thing and it can solve many problems. And actually, while the food industry talks itself about being very scientific and, you know, being full of R&D, I wasn't sure whether it was quite as impressive as some of the science I'd seen at Oxford or maybe when I looked and met other CEOs from other industries such as electronics or, you know, uh, or, or AI. So I was very interested in how the application of original science could solve some of these problems. And what Believe in Science is trying to do is take the junk out of the junk food, because believe it or not, that is the majority of what everyone eats. And it's the reason why we're all consuming more sugar and fat. Um, every year. 
I had to decide, you know, what 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 junk food was and what needed to come out of it, and picked the sweet bakery market. And you know, I picked this because it's global and it's an enormous market. And um, but also, what is kind of intriguing is no one's actually really ever managed to remove the sugar and fat out of bakery, and this really intrigued me. Um, some of the reasons for that is, you know, very commercial reasons. You know, people don't want to spend if you're a big company more money on maybe a more expensive ingredient to remove the sugar. Uh, several people have tried it and they haven't seen their sales grow. Maybe these unhealthy brands just aren't credible with the consumer when they make the health claim. But the bit which I really believed is a lot of these companies have tried to make better for you products. They've tried to remove some of these sugar, fat and calories and they've failed. And they would failed because sugar and fat has a more intrinsic role in this market than many others. It does many, many things. So if you're trying to make Diet Coke, really all you're trying to do is simulate a sweet taste profile. And that's why people worked out how to make sweet tasting drinks without sugar, you know, decades and decades ago. But in bakery, and if any of you bake, you'll know this, sugar and fat have more than 20 plus complex and technical roles. So I really saw this as the nub of the problem. How can you remove sugar and fat convincingly um, in bakery to give better products which taste as good as the ones on the market and to do this you know part of the thesis was we were going to have to go deeper than many other people so dough is actually a polymer science problem so how how could we work with polymer science scientists either within or outside the food industry to really understand how we can take it further icing is really a complicated rheology problem. Um, problem. It has very particular non-Newtonian properties that you want to reproduce, um, you know, without using uh, sucrose or any of the other disaccharide crystals. And, you know, kind of my absolute favorite, material science is incredibly good at characterizing, characterizing um, ingredients and materials. And how could we use these characterization techniques to really understand the exact type of food we were trying to create and and, and reproduce. Um, and the first product we've made, and you know, if you if you hunt hard enough, you can go and find this. And, I, and if you're interested, I can tell you tell you where to buy it. Um, was was a donut, and it was all about creating this specific dough that you could then expand with heat and set with a beam of steam, and then use all these clever techniques um, to produce the end product. Something which fooled the mind and the senses into thinking you were eating something far naughtier than you thought. Um, in terms of belief in science, while it's right up my street and, you know, kind of thoroughly enjoy that, it's not necessarily the way to sell things to consumers. So we've created this brand called Urban Legend. And the idea is we've made a product, you know, that is unbe unbelievable to the consumers. And Urban Legend is trying to prove that you don't need all the fat, sugar and calories to get to number one, that the way we've been formulating these foods for the past 200, 300 years isn't necessary. And there are a different set of techniques and ingredients out there. And we've made some very yummy and frankly, unbelievable donuts. Uh, we've taken so much of the sugar and fat out that they do have the same amount of calories as a slice of butter toast or a glass of milk. Um, and our hope is by consuming these instead of what consumers would normally eat, they're making um, a far healthier um, choice. What we also believe, you know, having done Grey's and Innocent, is that people copy success so that other people will look at what we've done and hopefully believe that they should be investing in their own R&D or that consumers can get excited about the healthier choice in an indulgent category. The good news is, you know, this this problem is is, is very of the moment. I mean, the UK and pretty much every country on the earth on the earth is facing an obesity crisis. Um, and, you know, the reason we set up the business was, was we believed that this type of science could help with that um, without necessarily the consumer having to change. But we're fitting with that legislation. Um, and, you know, we spent the, you know, the first six months of the business setting up pop up shops to try our ideas. But I think, you know, science is fun, but you've got to really understand how to appeal to the end consumer, how to make it exciting and compelling for them. And that's the business today. Um, we've come up with this product and we're selling it in a variety of different ways. We have some of our own stores. We're working with the likes of Telsco and Selfridges. I've even got a meeting with McDonald's tomorrow because they're intrigued about 
you know, the junk food which they produce and the extent to which these sort of scientific techniques can make their products um, healthier. And we're on Deliveroo and, and Uber Eats in London. So hopefully that's a, a, a useful whirlwind um, intro, but what I'm really interested in is what questions people have and whether I can help answer them. Thanks very much, Anthony. That was uh, that was really interesting. So um, yes, as uh, as Anthony just mentioned, the the floor is now open for questions. So uh, in the top right hand side of your screen, you should see a, a Q and A uh, panel where you can type a question and send that into us, and then we'll read them out and, and and pose them to Anthony. So if there's anything in particular you're desperate to know, um, some information about the products that that Anthony is creating, then please do type your questions in the in the box and then uh, send those over. Um, so while we wait for a few people to type some questions, I've, I've got a question for you, Anthony. So um, you mentioned about entrepreneurship and, and uh, going into that as a, as a kind of um, as a career. What's your advice for anyone who might be interested in, in going into entrepreneurship or is thinking about becoming an entrepreneur? Do you have any top tips for them? Yeah, I, and, you know, the, the you know, kind of uh, there's many stories out there, you know, Richard Branson, etc., who and Mark Zuckerberg who quit university and, you know, go off and set up their businesses. I, I think, frankly, these are the outliers and it's sort of quite an unusual thing to do. And maybe these were quite extraordinary um, people. Um, what I think has changed in the last 20 years in terms of employment is it's much easier to get well paid, high quality jobs at startups or scale ups. So either businesses which are very small or maybe which have had success and are now and are, and are now growing. And my advice would be why consider going to work for one of them and then you'll understand you know, the pros and cons. From my perspective, what I loved about Innocent was the freedom um, to pursue different projects. There was very few people in the business and it felt like every voice was important and it felt like you had a big impact. And many of my friends were amazed when I met up the responsibilities I had after six months versus maybe them in these graduate schemes where everyone had to sort of move at the same pace, and, you know, very much conform to, you know, what the, the company's views on the next five years of your career would look like. Great. Um, so, so did you find that your um, your role at Innocent? Did you find that your your you mentioned about you did your degree um, at Oxford? Was it in in chemistry? Was did you find that um, that had a had a significant impact when you joined Innocent? Did you find there were any skills that you had from your degree that were quite useful for when you started working there? Yeah, I I, I think I mean the the big ones really were about analytical skill, which I think is is true of of, of, of any of the of the physical sciences. So, <laughs> they admitted they they hired me you know on the, on the doorstep at that time uh because they thought i was good at math the first job i had actually was in manufacturing so i had to work out how many smoothies to make and how many bottles and caps to have and how many mangoes you needed to buy and the problem was back in those days innocent drinks went off very very quickly they were fresh and natural <laughs> so my job was to spin all these plates um but what quickly became apparent was it was getting too complicated to do this so I think, you know, because of my background, I went away and I wrote an algorithm and I wrote a program to, you know, predict things. And I, I, I wrote uh, equations, um, uh, you know, around how the supply chain should work and how much product it should have at different times and to flag when things were going wrong. Um, you know, these weren't direct skills I, I think I learned in my degree, but I think the de my degree taught me, you know, how can you understand a problem numerically? You know, how can you pull it apart and you know, really interrogate it. Uh, admittedly, a couple of times over the years in Innocent, you know, I, I did pull the odd blinder when <laughs> the odd chemistry question um, came up. But oddly, it was more Greys and the new venture where maybe more innovative, innovative science was used. Great. Um, so, uh, oh, so we've had a um, question come in. So um, someone says, thanks for your talk. How did studying chemistry influence what you wanted to do and the companies you created? Yeah, so I, I, I think I really loved studying chemistry, and then I really struggled in the in the research phase. Um, I, I think this is quite a common um, sentiment. I just wasn't very good at research. Um, it wasn't very tangible. You had to be quite um, patient, and I think one of the reasons I've loved working in entrepreneurial companies is because you do get a lot more feedback and a lot more buzz and you know maybe may, maybe it suits my strength but what i came away with was 
a deep respect and love of science of one of the most consistent ways of solving the world's major problems. And as I hope you picked up, the problem I really care about is people's health and, you know, kind of food's role in us all living enjoyable lives. And I suppose as my career has gone on, it's been easier to raise money and convince venture capitalists to back you and believe in science is something I'm deeply interested in. Um, and you know, luckily I've got the track record that I've convinced people to invest millions and millions in the business so we can pursue these type of um, scientific endeavors and, and show that the market can be changed. Great, um, so, um... We'll see if anyone else is going to submit any more questions. So if you're watching, please do. If you've got any burning questions, please do ask. Um, this is your prime time to to, to get answers um, from Anthony. So get some advice on entrepreneurship or the, or the field of um, the field of uh, industry that Anthony's in. And also any questions about chemistry in general, about studying chemistry and kind of what led into that, um, into those jobs. So when did you f uh, found your um, your current company, Anthony, your Urban Legend? Yeah, so I started around two years ago. Um, so um, originally invested directly in the science myself. I did some of it myself, which was fun coming coming back to it after, after, after so long. But, um, you know, I approached both people in the food industry who might be able to help, um, but also I approached some academics outside of the food industry. So, for instance, I'm doing a collaboration with the University of Sheffield's Material Science Department. And it's because I believe that polymer science is actually one of the best models for understanding um, some of these food problems. Um, but oddly, no polymer scientists or even material science scientists are that interested in food. So I'm trying to convince them that, yeah, uh, that they've got the answers to these 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 weighty problems. Um, so the, the business is around two years old. The original R&D took about a year. Uh, and then last summer we built our first test kitchen. Uh, so it, at night it's the test kitchen which makes donuts, which we sell to see <laughs> if people want them. And during the day it's a lab which, um, you know, we use to try and make better donuts and also explore, you know, kind of other, other ideas. Yeah, I found it fascinating in your talk when you were talking about the the rheology and the and the polymer science behind donuts. It's something you never really think about, but actually it's that even things like the, the, the size of the crystallites in, in icing sugar and, and toppings would all make a difference, I imagine. So everything makes a damn difference. I think the problem, you know, back to that, you know, tw 20, 20 odd functional properties, you you remove a bit of sugar and all hell breaks loose in, in, in quite a chaotic system. So trying to trying to understand that and uh, offset it is um, is why no one's really solved this problem today. Mm. Did you find when you were when you were looking into it, was there a lot of literature out there or did you have to apply material science research to food science or, or was there something to get the ball rolling? Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's some very good literature in some areas. So, for instance, there's a huge amount of literature on uh, bread, you know, uh, maybe because it's a global staple and, you know, a lot of uh, research on, you know, the way starches and glutens behave. And um, what there was also is, you know, a fair amount of research out there about sugar and fat reduction. But what most of this research said is it doesn't work. <laughs> you take it out and it goes wrong. Um, and, and this is what continually amazes me about science is sometimes you don't have to ask why very much until you realize that you have exhausted what you thought would be a well-researched area. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I think this is exciting, but this is where you find what I'd call the scientific constraint. Why, you know, what don't you know, which if you could work it out, could solve this problem. And then the fun bit starts and you go and start talking to, um, you know, academics or, you know, people, you know, who've been in the industry to try and ask, you know, find out who's got a good idea on how to solve these problems. And you, you know, you sometimes come up with some of your own as well. And did you um, did you specifically aim to start with donuts or did you find that that was the was there a reason why you started with that one or, or did it kind of come through your research into yeah. materials? So what what we wanted to do is is for someone to look at a product and taste a product and be like, wow, that is a very naughty indulgent product. Uh, but when they find out that it's got less sugar than an apple and less calories than a glass of milk and, you know, all these all these other statistics, they'd be amazed. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to prove to people 
that you could move beyond sugar and fat and really in, 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 enjoy a product. Um, and I think it was the, it wouldn't have been quite the same if we did a muffin. People aren't as excited about muffins as donuts, <laughs> I think is the, is one way of putting it. Got nothing against muffins. I'm sure we'll do a muffin at some stage, but <laughs> not where you start. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a particular flavour of donut that's your favourite of the ones you've created? Yeah, so um, one of the best sellers is Belgium Speculose. Uh, which is, you know, if, if people know the kind of um, cookie butter, what would you call it? Yeah, cookie, you know, it's a, it's a big in Belgium, but, you know, it, it's popular over here. I, I think it's tremendous. Great, and, and slightly less guilt, uh, slightly less guilt involved if it's uh, lower calories and... <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's the idea. And, uh... um, so do you have any advice on what makes a good entrepreneur? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's very stressful, you know, starting a business. And I, I think it's it, it's worth being aware of the odds. And that is, you know, very few of them succeed. You know, in, in, in fact, if you, you know, if you manage to raise initial funding, 80% um, still go bust before they manage to raise their, their next set of funding. So I think you've got to be very aware but also at peace with this jeopardy <laughs> you know in terms of you, you, you you're launching yourself um, 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 into I, I think the other thing is you, you're going to have so many problems as in so many people will say no or things will not work or just the sheer volume of things you need to do to get a small business off the off, off the ground is enormous so you know how interested are you in the subject you know how determined are you to see it through um, I started believing science because I really cared about it and I really believed in it. Um, there's many businesses which might be better ideas, but I just wasn't that passionate. So, um, you know, what would that have meant once you're a couple of years in? You know, would you would you, would you still have been motivated? And myself, um, you know, not so. Um, but I'm I mean, what you said, Zoe, I absolutely believe is 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 true, and that, that is being an entrepreneur or working in entrepreneurial companies has become much more normal and it's a completely reasonable career step well when i joined innocent 20 years ago my parents slightly freaked out they didn't know why i wasn't on the milk round or going to work for somebody you know uh, whose logo you know they would recognize and they you know they'd be able to um tell their friends i, I don't believe that's as much the case anymore that's interesting to see how the how the kind of landscape of of companies and and kind of all these spin outs and entrepreneurs has, has kind of changed um, over the last 20 years. Um, so did you have any experience in materials chemistry before you started your um, your uh, your current job? You, you mentioned about the rheology and things like that. Was that something you'd encountered during your degree or was that something you'd kind of got more into afterwards? Well, I think this is, you know, when you're interested in a subject, you want to get to the bottom of it. And the more I dug around, you know, and, and looked at, learned about polymer science, which had come up during my degree, but you know, it's, you have to cover so many things in um, three or four years. Uh, and more I learned about material science, I was like, hang on, this is, this is really relevant. The characterization of materials, um, the understanding of how polymers contribute to very strange material behaviour seems to be the crux of this problem. Um, and, you know, when I showed material sciences, scientists these problems or polymer scientists even, um, they'd give different answers to the food scientists. They'd give more fundamental scientific answers. And, and this excited me. I was like, you're looking at this problem differently. Um, you are better able to characterise the system and what is driving these changes and, you know, suggest analytical techniques to prove it, probe it. Um, and, you know, I'm now interested in polymer science and material science because they're relevant to the business, but also I do think they're fascinating, uh, you know, areas in their own right. Yeah, I always remember when I was an undergraduate, I did some lectures about um, the chemistry of chocolate and how the different phases of, of chocolate can can influence the taste. And I always found that fascinating. And I think it's an area that's not always explored that often. Um, I wonder I wonder why more people don't go into the food industry or do you find a lot of people do or, or is it kind of traditionally a chemistry based uh, 
is it traditionally chemistry graduates that go into the food industry or is it kind of different subjects in yeah. particular? I, I I think the major people who go to do food science in the food industry are people who've done degrees in food science. Um, I, I, I think the problem with the degrees in food science is, you know, they're not as rigorous as a physical science degree. They're sort of more applied. And, uh, you know, what I absolutely believe is people who can take their skills, uh, you know, from a physical, you know, a rigorous figure, figure physical science degree, uh, you know, like uh, chemistry at Oxford, will approach the problem differently when they get into industry. They won't rely on descriptive knowledge. They may be more challenging. They may be more open to using different analytical techniques to really probe and understand, you know, what's happening. So I think I don't think that it's is that they don't, um, but I wouldn't say it's a popular career move, and I do think that's a shame. Yeah, hopefully this uh, hopefully this this uh, session will uh, give some give some people some uh, kind of open their eyes into a different field that they can go into with a with a chemistry degree. Yeah, I, I think to me, it, you know, it's just as rigorous as you know working on something like biosynthesis in um, you know in the in, in the pharmaceutical um, industry. Um, I think the difference is you make a tangible product, um, and you know your products can become famous, which, um, you know, kind of is exciting and real and tangible in a way that sometimes, you know, chemistry can be a bit abstract, you know, what's really going on in that, you know, solvent you're, 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 you're peering into. Um, and, you know, that's why one of the reasons I love it. It must be quite rewarding seeing the product that you've been working on for months or years being on the shelf and being enjoyed by consumers. When it sells, yes. I mean, the, the, the opposite, you know, I've, I've, I've made hundreds of products and uh, many haven't sold. So <laughs> occasionally you can spend years thinking that you've reinvented the world and just no one's interested. OK, so we've had another question come in. So um, what advice would you give for someone thinking of studying chemistry at university? I mean, I think it's, um, you know, a fantastic degree if you're interesting, interested in it. And um, I think it's really well respected by many employers. So so my view is uh, if you're going to enjoy doing the degree and you know, th then you want to kind of move on to employment. You're only going to be very positively received. Um, if you love it so much that you want to stay in it and, you know, become a scientist or, or an academic, you know, then you can decide to take that next step, um, you know, kind of later in your career. Um, but I, I think one of the things to always ask yourself is, you know, do you want to pick a degree because it's a sensible choice or do you want to pick a degree because, you know, you do enjoy it and you do love it a bit? Um, so I, I think if you make a decision based on the latter, it's always going to be better for you. And, and what made you uh, decide to study chemistry at university when you were applying? Yeah, I just I I I just really loved knowing why stuff happened. Uh, I, I I think casting my mind back, and I think that's what I've always loved about the scientists is sciences. They they've got all these models and answers and ways of looking at the world, which explains the why behind it. And you know maybe that's partially what motivates me now with believe in science uh, and urban legend is. I just really want to understand why we can't not you why we can't get away from sugar and fat. <laughs> Can anyone really explain to me why it can't be done? And you know the answer is I do believe it can be done. It just extraordinarily hasn't necessarily been invented yet. So in case anyone's joined us while we've been while we've been chatting, if anyone has any questions, please use the the Q, the Q and A. Uh, function at the top of the, your screen. On the right hand side, you should see a panel that will open that will allow you to type any questions you may have. Um, please do send them in if there's anything in particular you want to know, if you've got any questions about any of the content that Anthony's been discussing or any questions based on what we've just been talking about, please do send them in um, and we will ask them. Um, so you mentioned that you uh, studied at Oxford, but also at Princeton. So was that a, an exchange programme or did you did you go over or to Princeton after Oxford or, or vice versa? Oh, no, I was, I was very lucky. So Oxford offers offer something called um, the part two where you go and do research. And I uh, managed to convince them to let me go and do that research mainly in America, uh, which 
which was an extraordinary experience, as is, you know, taking yourself out of your comfort zone and taking yourself to somewhere new. Um, so, so yeah, I did a bit of my part to at Oxford, but the majority in Princeton. Oh, that sounds great. Um, so uh, someone's asked, uh, what was your favourite thing about studying in Oxford? Oh, I mean, one of my favourite things was definitely the friends I made because it's demanding and it's tough. And, you know, I don't believe anyone finds it easy, but um, the chemists at my college, I think it really bound us together and we were very supportive of each other and we helped each other. Um, and, you know, maybe we we're slightly geeky and talked about chemistry, <laughs> maybe slightly more than was, was, was healthy. And we all did very well together. And, you know, that leaves me with a lot of warmth and I'm still very good friends with these people. So, um, yeah, spending four years with a small group of people, you know, kind of going through these experiences together, you know, for me was very rewarding. That's great to hear. Which which college were you at, Anthony? So I was at Jesus. So that's um. So it's uh, I'm I'm thinking for people who are uh, who are uh, listening in on this. So so is Jesus quite a large college or is it quite small for chemistry? Yeah, I mean it's it's famously medium sized. So it's 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 not very famous. It's not very old. Uh, it's not the richest. It's not the poorest. It's um, it's famous for being Welsh. Um, uh, but you know I. I it's famous for being friendly, um, but also it has a lot of chemists. So, I mean, the reason I applied there is um, I, I, I believe it had tutors in all of the three, you know, major branches of chemistry, in organic, inorganic and, and physical, but also had a very large intake. And I liked the idea of not being too on your own, uh, which was borne out. You know, it was a, a large part of the enjoyment was, I think, this positive culture we had between us. And I'd have hated to try and do it on my own. I mean, it's an intimidating degree. Why would you not want to share the burden with others? Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people mention about studying at Oxford is, is the collegiate system and, and the colleges are kind of each their own individual community that um, there's always, you know, a group of people who are studying the same subjects as you, um, who you kind of work alongside for, for the four years of your degree. And I think that's something that the college, the, the college system um, it is quite an interesting an interesting system um, to have where you've got these kind of, even though everyone is studying the same degree, everyone being at different colleges means it's a completely different community that you might go back to after all your lectures or your practical classes. Yeah. And I, I think we were all very different people, but, you know, kind of from, you know, very different backgrounds, but the experiences we went through and our interest in the subject really bound us together, you know, and, um, you know, kind of fr friends to this day. That's great. So, so how many people were in your college, uh, were in your year at your college? Oh, gosh, I don't know, uh, over 100, but I think it was 10 doing chemistry, which was unusual for that many. That's that's a lot. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, 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 that, that's what attracted me. And I think that's what, um, you know, kind of uh, you know, made it a slightly unique experience. And, and the follow up question for uh, that someone's asked is, what was your least favourite thing about studying at Oxford? Um, I mean, <laughs> there's definitely pros and cons because it's such a it's such a, a unique place. Um, it was demanding hard work, um, and I, I think especially at first, I was very worried. Um, you know, was I good enough? Could I do it? You know, was it too much? And you know, I, th I think looking back, part of that was a type of culture shock. It was adjusting from. Uh, a school system to a university system and you know learning a different set of skills and um yeah you know, i think myself and you know my kind of cohort all adjusted to that you know over time and 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 were successful and 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 embraced it um but yeah i think doing a science at oxford you you know there's some subjects where you can hide away a bit you know uh, i was always intrigued about the relative amounts of work my friends who are art, you know art students versus science students did um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of work and you will be challenged. So the, the next question to, that's come in is uh, someone's asked, did you always want to study chemistry? Um, and the follow on question being, did you ever want to study business given your future entrepreneurship? Well, if I could have my time again, what, you know, what, 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 what bizarre mashup of degrees would you, would you um, um, invent? Um, I, 
I had a hunch I wanted to study chemistry and I, I think, um, I, you know, I did A-levels and really enjoyed the increase in sophistication from GC, GCSE to A-level. So, yeah, I, I think I did want to, to, to study chemistry. Um, what I wish, looking back, uh, was I'd got more general business exposure, you know, while at university. Um, I, I, you know, I, and I, and again, I, I, I think, you know, speaking about one of the areas I'm interested, in, which is entrepreneurism, Oxford is now very strong on this. So lots of people do start many businesses and side hustles at university. There is, you know, the Oxford Foundry, which supports students to pursue ideas, including spinning out, uh, you know, uh, research, um, etc. Was that as developed 20 years ago? I don't believe so. You know, was I was I self-aware enough to know that this was something to go and spend your time doing? Maybe not. Um, but, you know, I, I think part of the challenge at Oxford is there's so many things you could do with your time. Um, the challenge is really knowing yourself and, you know, what you want to get out of it. Uh, and I think the happiest people maybe are sometimes the people who are not trying to do everything, but, you know, know what they want to get out of their university experience. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Um, so so tell us a bit more about your, your current company, your uh, Believe in Science. Um, do you have any um, kind of any uh, extra points you'd like to tell us about the company and how that came to be or, or the current things you're working on as well as your yeah. urban legend work? I mean, I mean, the exciting news uh, is um, this week we are raising a further £7 million pounds um in in funding oh, wow. uh, so so we, you know um the you know it's shown a certain amount of process uh progress sorry and and excited investors and you know we've done some trials in you know, large retailers like tesco and, and actually now lots of people want to invest in it uh, so this is exciting because it means that people believe in what you believe in um and that is you know that science can solve this problem and there's a you know you know, maybe here in the UK we can pioneer, you know, a set of food technologies which are quite radical and leading in the world. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it's uh, it's got some very promising uh, promising things developments happening in the next few uh, months or years. Um, and, and if you're wondering that the, these are the brand colours, I don't normally wear <laughs> hooded jumpers for, for video conferences. So uh, yeah. <laughs> We picked pink because it was very distinctive and bright. So, oh, yeah, that means that. Uh, yeah, I saw your uh, your, your pop up stores in uh, in London being the same sort of uh, pink and yellow. There is branding. a lot of pink. <laughs> um, um, so um, I think there's another question that's just come through. Um, so is there something in the food industry you'd want to tackle next after what you've achieved with donuts? Great question. Um, well, bakery is seen as one of the hardest products to take the sugar and fat out of. Uh, the very hardest is, you know, believed to be chocolate, you know, which has got a lot of sugar and a lot of fat in it. Um, and, you know, hopefully I, I can learn some good skills in believe in science and crack bakery, which will, um, you know, mean when the times comes, you know, can, can you take it even further, some of the ideas and, you know, apply it to chocolate. The chocolate without the sugar and fat does not taste good. There, there are many chocolate, there's many companies have tried. <laughs> I, they, they, it doesn't taste good. I was, I was going to ask, because there have been many trials in, in that. Oh, yeah, I mean, lots of, been been to it. lots of people have tried to do it. Um, and, you know, America's full of startups at the moment. Um, and, yeah. I, I wouldn't say that they've back to the like for like. Was there a lot of experimentation for your to kind of perfect your donuts before you you uh, managed to get them out into into shops? Was there anything you tried that didn't work very well, or something well, that? I mean, you try so many things which don't work, and um, you know, I invested my own money in, in in this in this business. And at one stage, my wife tasting a very average donut was just like, well, what do you think the percentage of chance that you can actually crack this problem? And I was like, fifty oh, percent at best, to, you know, which you. You know, despaired at um, how much you've been invested, but uh, you know, by by that stage. So, you know, I, you know, I think many people on this call know this is that part of the problem with science is you don't necessarily know whether something you know can be cracked. You've got to go and explore it, and the whole eureka moment is when you something shifts in your brain or you get a result back, which is so surprising that it 
gives you the result or the visibility of the, the system you're after. Yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot to be said for the, the I mean, chemistry is, is all about experimentation, but actually the, the, the kind of thought processes and the and the um, the kind of uh, approaches that you have to take when you do chemistry can be applied to a lot of different settings that aren't just specifically scientific, but you know, every, you know, you have to try one thing and say, OK, right, I know when to walk away from this or this. This works, but this bit doesn't. Let's see what we can do and kind of change one thing at a time. Um, and I think those skills are, are are very useful in a lot of different careers and a lot of different fields. Um, I think sometimes people think chemistry, if you do a degree in chemistry, you're just going to be working in a lab, but actually the skills you get from it are applicable in so many other different different fields and different careers. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think you only open doors by doing chemistry. You, you definitely don't um, close them and I, I, you know, I, I, I think if you do it somewhere like Oxford, you will change your, it will change you, you know, how you look at the world and process data and consider evidence or, you know, design experiments outside the field of science. And speaking of experiments, someone's asked, did you experiment a lot in your own kitchen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in the utility room and in the shed in the garden and in a lab which someone lent me until I ran out of space for ingredients and, and, uh, and, and machinery. Uh, but yeah, the beauty of food is you can kind of get away with, you don't need an enormous NMR machine necessarily. <laughs> Did you, um, were you into baking and cooking a lot before you uh, before you started this or was this something that's become of an interest since you've, since you've uh, started developing these donuts? Well, I've, I've always been into food, uh, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've been interested in its role in, in, in all of our lives and it's how I've made my livelihood. So. Um, you know, always been interested in it. I mean, famously, I was always a useless baker because I never did follow the recipes, which, you know, kind of, uh, and then that's part of the problem. If you don't follow the re recipes, it's a chaotic system and you get bad results, um, which I, <laughs> I suppose I'm relaxed about sk skiing off piste and finding out how, how you can do that. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's a bit a bit safer to do that in a in a kitchen rather than in a in a chemistry lab when you're doing your part two or your <laughs> undergraduate practicals. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I've been shocked. I think this is just as true for, you know, kind of science as it is for you know kind of food science is how many times you've done something slightly wrong, and and got the breakthrough. So, uh, I, I I put the wrong settings on a piece of machinery once and got a very strange result. You know, with the donut, um, and it was only then realizing what I'd done and trying to work out why it gave such a different result that gave a, you know, a, a massive breakthrough on the surface permeability of you know the material and you know how that affects things like the retention of gases or the repulsion of fat in in the flash fry step. I was about to ask: Is there any point? Is was there any points where you had a kind of eureka moment of something that that you thought, "Oh, that's strange," and actually, it's it turned out to be a bit of a breakthrough. But it sounds very much like that was one of them. Yeah, and I I think why I love food is my my hunch is that they come along slightly more frequently. Um, while um, you know, academic research you can slog away for an awful long time <laughs> waiting for the eureka. Maybe it's bigger and better because of it, but um, um, because of the tangibility of the product, you can examine it and taste it and you know you know take a certain amount away from it so what was your research about it for your part two over in princeton yeah so i was looking at radio pharmaceuticals so this was uh, a branch of cancer treatment where radioactive metals are injected into the body and what you need to do is work out how to get them to go to the tumors um, and they emit radiation over a very short range and kill the cancerous cells. Um, so I was trying to attach various things to these um, uh, rhenium metals so that they would stick to the cancer cells. Um, so did you find, was, was your job at Innocent the first, your first kind of foray into, into food science or did you have any experience of that before working there? No, 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 I, you know, kind of um, loved food. I remember being, I remember food coming up a few times in the degrees and like you being interested. I was like, oh, it's nice to know how mayonnaise is made. I remember, you know, came up in intermolecular reactions and, you know, as you said, the polymorphism of chocolate is fascinating in terms of how you create it and why it works. Um, but no, it didn't feature in a big way 
in the in the in the in, in, in the degree. You've just got so much to cover, haven't you? In such a big old subject, chemistry. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, especially with the eight week terms. <laughs> So uh, we are coming towards the end of our Ask a Chemist section. So if anybody has any last questions that they would like to ask, then please do do type away now. Do let us know if there's anything you want to know um, before the session finishes. So we're in, into the last few minutes. Um, so is there anything else that you'd like to, to add, Anthony? Anything that you... Um, uh, I, think, I, think I, I think I've laid out my case. I, you know, I <laughs> science and chemistry is is hugely important, and you know, if you're passionate about it, it's a, you know, it's a great stepping stone to so many, you know, other things. Um, uh, and you know, personally, I think the food industry is a great place to work. And you know, if there are people listening who are intrigued about being an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I'd say your time at university might be a chance to start to explore some of those things or certainly don't just be distracted by the companies with the famous names. Great, so I, I don't think there's been any further questions, so I think with that we'll, we'll wrap up. But thank you very much, Anthony, for spending your time to come and uh, speak to us all today. Hopefully uh, the attendees have all found it useful. There's been some good questions in the chat. Um, so thank you everyone for attending um, and uh, do keep an eye out on the website for any more Ask a Chemist uh, sessions which will be uh, advertised soon. Uh, if they're going to be any more they'll be on the website. Um, so yeah thanks very much Anthony, good luck with the with the new project, good luck with the donuts and I hope this week goes well with your with your meetings with the, with the other brands. Yeah thank you very much, thank you very much all. <laughs>